Hello, I'm Anthony. Welcome back to the Essential Guide to System Configuration in Cubase 12. The purpose of this video series is to help us understand how Cubase's preferences and options are configured, where they, where they live, how we can manually edit them or interact with them in a useful manner, and really just to gain a, a good overall understanding of how our system works, primarily so that if anything ever goes wrong with our system, we can rebuild it as quickly as possible. We don't have to be worried about this glass house being constructed with thousands of options that take hundreds of hours to configure, all suddenly disappearing down the drain when something goes wrong. If you're liking this series and you want to help support my channel, check out the Patreon and YouTube channel member links below. Awesome way to do that. Huge thanks to everybody who's signed up so far. I'm going to take a look at a couple of things today. Um, key commands, keyboard shortcuts, and project color options. And the reason I've chosen those two things is because it gives me a good opportunity to have a chat about a couple of really important uh, configuration files in the background and to get a, a kind of a basic understanding of how to manipulate those files and, and how to edit them if we need to. Key commands first. I've actually started in my basic standard um, project folder. So as you can see, all of my colors are set up correctly. This is how I have Cubase configured uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. If I head into key commands and we look down at the macros section below, you'll see that I have some macros configured. So these are the macros that I currently use. I don't keep macros that I don't use. So I tend to keep this list pretty lean but I'm going to show you today where they live. By way of a little thank you to my patrons and YouTube channel members, I'll make all of the macros and various project options that we discussed today uh, available to you via download links. So here we've got our macros. I've got all sorts of key commands configured. I have an, uh, an expert keys external keyboard shortcut um, module here. That took an awful long time to configure. It's got a hell of a lot of different key commands configured in it, so I really don't want to have to rebuild all of this stuff. And this is one of these aspects where I'm really speaking more to the person who's recovering a, recovering an existing system. Configuring key, keyboard shortcuts themselves, it's really very straightforward. You know, you select your option and then you type whatever you want your shortcut key to be. Um, but recovering them in the event of a failure, that's what we want to talk about today. So having taken a very quick look at Cubase as it exists on my current system. I'm now going to close this application down and I've flipped these two preferences folders back around again, renamed my standard one to full. This is the uh, the initialized application which I've now called 1264 and so Cubase sees that as the primary pre preferences folder. And not only of all, of all of our colors reverted back to their defaults, but now when we go into key commands we won't see any of those macros. We'll see a new list of macros. This is the stuff that comes default out of the main application. So we basically need to be able to rebuild both our keyboard shortcuts, which are probably the single most important piece of basic configuration information as far as I'm concerned, because it takes so long to track them all down and configure them. You really don't want to have to do that twice. But I also want to get all of my macros back. Let's do that first. Now here's my production ready preferences folder. Don't forget the one called full is my fully featured all singing, all dancing configuration folder. And we've got this file here called keycommands.xml. That contains all of the information we need to see. I'm gonna open it so that we can have a look inside. Here are all the key commands and you can see that wherever you've got a single line uh, with just a name, there's no keyboard shortcut being assigned for it. But if I scroll down eventually, oh, there's one. We're going to come, come across options that have a key value and there you can see control shift N is what um, activates the cycle follows range selection. So this is how you configure shortcuts. Um, now I, I don't recommend that you do this manually because it's way more trouble than it's worth. You know, use the interface itself to perform your, um, your updates. But this is what we're going to copy across. Furthermore, at the bottom of the key commands file, I'll just uh, control end to cycle, uh, scroll all the way to the bottom of the file. Here are all our macros. If I scroll up far enough. In order to be able to do anything functional with these um, preferences files, these XML preferences files, you do need a little bit of basic XML editing skill. Now you can open any of these files for read only purposes in any browser and we have these little drop down options, which basically kind of collapse the entire list. Here it is right down at the bottom with the ellipsis. If I open the arrow again, we see all of the contents inside. If I want to edit or change the contents of this file, 
we'll need to perform a separate operation. We'll see that a little bit later in this video. But all I want to do today is copy this entire file. So looking at it in a browser is completely fine. But here are all my macro options, delete near doubles, delete very near doubles. This is what Cubase does when you execute a macro. It runs all of these commands individually. That's what a macro is. It's just a collection of independent functions gathered together to provide a single kind of seamless interface. So I want all of this stuff. Now, unfortunately, I can't just copy this file and paste it into my main application folder. This 1264 folder is the one that Cubase is using right now. I can't do that, it won't work. Cubase loads these files up when the, when the application first launches. And when you close the application, it overwrites the file with its current um, understanding of all of its configuration data. So any changes that you make are basically updated uh, when you close the application. If I paste this file from my production folder into my application folder and close the program down, when I reopen it, it's gonna be as if I never performed that operation. It'll basically throw all of that stuff away. So here we have a golden rule. Follow this at all times for the rest of this video series. If you're performing any edit operations on this roaming folder, close Cubase first, okay? Right, so I'm gonna do that. I'm gonna close Cubase. I'll lose my microphone, so I'll do this offline, but I'm literally just gonna copy this key commands file and I'm gonna paste it into this uh, primary folder and then I'll come back. See you in a minute. Relaunch Cubase and here are all my macros and all of my key commands are there as well. I'm not gonna dive into them to prove that, but basically this is my existing production environment and here are all of the macros fully defined as you can see. So that's a really, really simple process. If you're recovering your key commands.xml, you can copy across lock, stock and barrel. Now this is something worth mentioning actually. If you're building a brand new machine um, and you, you reinstall Cubase and you wanna get back up and running, there is nothing stopping you picking up your entire preferences folder and dropping it in place. That's why these folders are stored inside a subfolder called roaming. They're designed to do that. That's the purpose of them. What I'm trying to show you here is a little bit more of a, of a look under the hood so that you understand what you're doing. And if you get to a situation where you can't do that comprehensive copy, something in your preferences has corrupted and you can't find what it is, we can extract the useful stuff safely, drop it into the new folder and everything is going to work. Key commands is one of those examples where there's nothing destructive in this folder. You can pick up the entire thing, drop it into your new folder and you basically can't possibly do anything wrong because it's literally just keyboard shortcuts. The other thing that I wanna to do today is get the colors sorted. Now there's a couple of different areas where project colors matter. We have a look in the project drop down, project colors setup. This is a cheat. This is one of those few uh, situations where I basically kind of rushed ahead a little bit when I was setting up for this video series, but I'm gonna show you how to actually configure these colors today and where that stuff lives. In the main preferences options, we've got the user interface defaults down here. And again, all of these have been configured to my liking, so I'll show you where all of those live. Just to give us something to look out for when I make these various edits in the track type default colors, you can see that in this instance of Cubase, I've got basically slate blue set everywhere. When I pull my um, main project colors across, you'll see these colors change. Let's have a look where all of that stuff is. We're gonna be dipping into two separate preferences files. The first one is called userpreferences.xml. Now, to be absolutely honest with you, this is another file that I think you're perfectly safe copying across in its entirety. And in fact, that's what I'll do today. I've not been able to find anything in here that I think would have any impact on your system. And when we have a look in this file, we can see that it's really just on and off flags. Yes, no options, drop down selections, basically your, your primary configuration for all of the options in the preferences window are stored here. Now I've actually made a note of all of the different tag names. So these six different tag names here, if you want a screenshot, you'd see them, but I'm not recommending that you edit these things manually. If for instance, I copy that one into my clipboard and drag that out of the way. I now search for that tag somewhere in this file. Here we've got the various options. So you can see the surface controllers, we've got a few rulers, 
controls, warning, info lines, multiple. What does that look like in the main application? So here you can see we've got four ruler background options, inactive, active, reverse, and independent. It's these four here. So you could theoretically pick each of these blocks up. Remember what I was telling you about these little drop-down um, options? You could theoretically pick each of these groups up and copy them into your user preferences file. I'm not recommending that you do that. It's not something that I would bother doing. I would copy the entire user preferences file across and simply presume it was going to work. I've never had any issue with that file, so I've got no reason to, to think it wouldn't. But once I've done that, once I've copied the user preferences file across, all of these colors are going to update to my existing project defaults. The second place that we need to look if we want to update these project colors, so these are my primary project colors. You can see that for me, bass guitar is red, vocals are pink and so on. These are hugely important to me. They're a really great visual clue when I'm writing songs. All of these colors mean something. So that you can see that the group shade, any group folder is always a slightly darker shade of the primary thing. And the same with the MIDI tracks if I'm using like Omnisphere as a primary instance and then I've got three MIDI tracks underneath all pointing at it. There'll be a slightly lighter shade of the parent color. So this stuff really has a significant, a practical significance to me. And so I want all of these project colors set up and we find all of that information in probably the single most important of all of the preferences files, which is defaults.xml. Now this time I'm not gonna just double click it. As you can see, it defaults to opening in Microsoft Edge. If I open defaults.xml in Microsoft Edge, it's not going to be very pretty at all. We don't want any of that. What I am going to do instead, however, is right click, edit with Notepad++. Uh, Notepad++ is great. Uh, it's free. Here's the website. Heartily recommend you download this thing. It's absolutely awesome. And now we can see our file. And if I drag my little notes file across, you can see project colors block starts with P color controller. What am I talking about? Well, let's search for that tag somewhere in this file. And here it is. So this is where all of my project colors live. And there you can see my bass, my bass group, vocals, vocal group. The reason I've opened this in Notepad++ is because I want to copy all of this data. And this is one of those instances where I really am going to pick up a block of text from my old defaults.xml file that contains all of the stuff that I want. And I'm gonna copy this entire section of text and paste it into the, new, uh, into the new application. Now, as you can see, I've already done this, but it's a very straightforward process. Hello, future Anthony here, just, uh, just intervening because I didn't do a particularly good job of explaining this. And it's so important not to make any mistakes when you're copying blocks of text around XML files. I wanted to be absolutely clear what we've got is uh, two copies of File Explorer. One of them is pointing at my full rig. So 1264 is currently my real world Cubase setup. On the right hand side, I've reinitialized Cubase to its absolutely default factory settings. So this is, the Cubase has just built this folder completely new. So what I'm gonna do is right click on each of these files and I'm gonna say edit with Notepad++. So this tab is the first copy. So that's my production environment. And when I do the second copy, it's gonna open in a separate tab over here, but that's basically my factory setting. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna search for that tag that I looked for previously, which is the P color something. And there it is. And what I'm gonna do is select this entire section. So this is me arrow up and down, but when I press the shift key, I start selecting all of this block of text. And I'm gonna scroll down until I find an item block at the same tab level, the same ordinal level as the start, as the start token, all the way down and right down at the bottom of the screen. There it is. So having just selected all of that text, I'm now pressing delete and it's gone. So where my cursor currently is, I'm not gonna move. That cursor is gonna stay absolutely there flashing. Now I'm gonna hop over to my production environment. I'm gonna find that same block of text, P color. Here it is. And here you can see my properly configured, there's my group 
colors, as you can see. Do exactly the same thing. Get my cursor right to the very left hand extreme of the line, then shift down, 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 all the way down until I get to the terminating item block. And now press Control C to copy that text to my clipboard. Hop back over to the new environment. Here's my red minus sign. Press paste. And I've just pasted that block of text into the defaults XML file. So now if I save that file, this is going to save to the CQBase 1264 factory in the header at the top. So this is, you can tell where the file is. Save that, close the file down, close everything down, and we're done. Now back to our regularly scheduled presentation. Sorry for the interruption. Now, hopefully I don't have to tell you to be careful with all of this stuff. If you get these XML tags wrong, or you paste it in the wrong place, you'll corrupt the XML file and Cubase won't be able to read from it. So make sure you back up all of this stuff before you start. Make sure you know what you're doing as far as copying blocks of XML text around are concerned. And make sure Cubase isn't running in the background when you do all of this. But with all of those caveats in place, it literally is just a case of copying this section of text out of your old defaults XML file, pasting it into your new one. And when you relaunch uh, Cubase, you'll get all of the colors that you want. So I'll, make, I'll copy this block of text if you want to use exactly the same project colors as me. Uh, I'll make it available to my patrons and YouTube channel members. So what I'm going to do now is close Cubase once again. I'm going to pick up my user preferences XML file from the full folder, copy it in here, and we'll see what that looks like. And here we are back again. So I'm still pointing at my recently initialized folder, but as you can see, all of the colors are now exactly as they are in my full, full production setup. We have a look in the preferences folder. All of those colors are now set to the colors that I have in my main rig. These are the ones that I told you to take note of because they were all slate blue in the original version. Now they've all picked up the colors that I want. As a matter of interest, in my faders colors, you can see that I actually set all of those to dark gray. So I don't want the fader control buttons themselves to actually be different colors. I, I like them being monochrome. In the track and mix, up, mix console channel colors, um, you can see that I turn all of the colorizer options on and have the color strength set to maximum. This is the thing that gives me mixer colors the same as my track colors. I really, really like that. I don't want multiple shades. That's too confusing for my brain. So I set everything to maximum strength and that's the way I like to see it. That'll do us for today. Hope you enjoyed the episode. If you did, please hit like and I'll see you next time. Thanks a lot.